Welcome everybody. We'll just give a moment for people to come on screen with us. Welcome everyone to our webinar on turning moments into habits. I'm Tammy Parler, Chief Executive of the Women's Sport Trust and will be your host this morning. Research that the Women's Sport Trust in two circles published in 2021 in the Closing the Visibility Gap study predicted that revenue generated by women's sport in the UK would more than treble in value to 1 billion per year by 2030. The report also concluded that increased visibility of female athletes and teams was key to achieving this. Our regular Women's Sport Trust visibility reports aim to address the findings of that uh, study, which highlighted the lack of data around women's sport. And they've shown that there has been incredible growth in the visibility of women's sport in the past two years. There's still lots to be done, though, to understand habit in women's sport, from capturing attention in the first place to moving them along the journey to becoming habitually engaged. That's where this research came from. We wanted to take advantage of the events that were happening last year to dig deeper into the experiences fans are having around women's sport. Research like this will help the whole industry progress and is essential to the development of women's sport. But the reality is that budgets within women's sport are still sometimes limited. So to make this happen, then six partners came together. Women's Sport Trust, Two Circles, UK Sport, the FA, ECB and the RFU. To grow sustainably in the longer term, these sorts of meaningful partnerships are absolutely essential. So firstly, a big thank you for making this possible. So to the research, here to present the findings is Claire Vigors, Claire's Services Director for Two Circles, to delve into that question of how to turn moments into habits. She'll be joined by representatives from all the other partners involved. Now, following the presentation, there'll be a chance to ask questions. So please note, right at the bottom of your screen, there's a question tab and use this to highlight those. And you can also download the slides later from the Women's Sport Trust website. Claire, over to you. Thank you, Tammy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my uh, vast living room here. Lovely to, lovely to have you with me today. Um, as Tammy said, this is all about turning moments into habits. Um, and for the next 45 minutes or so, we will be focusing together on how to grow women's sports. Now, I'm actually going to start today with a bit of a question, quite existential for a Wednesday morning, depending on where you are in the world. Why are we here? Why are we here? Why does it matter today? Now, you might be sitting there thinking, oh, actually, it's because I want to learn something about women's sports. You might actually be really embedded in the world of women's sports already. And it might be actually about getting some data that backs up a hunch that you've always had or you've always believed in. Or it might be about finding that single data point that you can get to take out into your organisation or to your partners to help do more in growing women's sports. Why ever you're here, I really hope that there's something that you can take away today to tell a really compelling story. And I've got three words for you today to look out for, and they are opportunity, excitement, and attendances. And we will come back to those as we go through. So as Tammy said, 2022 was a record-breaking year for women's sports. Probably don't need to tell most of you on this call that at all. Um, we can just look at some of the stats on the next slide. We can see that visibility is increasing attendance records have been smashed in loads of different sports around the world the values of sponsorship and media rights are on the rise female athletes are breaking through more and more and we've seen that over the past few years but actually what we need to do now is to turn those moments of breakthrough into habits and on the right hand side of the screen here what you can see is that women's sports still tends to have more breakthrough moments than ongoing habitual consumption and that really, really matters. If we just go to the next slide, we'll see that habits really rely on a consistent loop of cue, routine and reward. So it is 10 a.m. in the UK where we are at the moment. And it might be the sort of time when people start to smell coffee coming from somewhere, from the kitchen, from the office. And that might be your cue to walk over to the cupboard and to grab a biscuit, because that's what you do every time you smell coffee it's habitual, it's part of your routine. And you get that reward, that sugar rush from the biscuit that makes you feel pretty good. That means that you're likely to keep doing that habit again and again. Now, hopefully none of you are going off to make a coffee or grab a biscuit now rather than listen to this. 
Um, but what I'd like you to do is think about that as we go through today. How do we create this loop, this habitual loop that gets people consuming women's sports on an ongoing basis? And it's really important that we do this because it's habitual consumption that underpins commercial growth. It's fans consuming regularly, frequently and in known ways that build a solid base for future growth commercially across every revenue line. Just as a quick example of that, we know that it is five times more expensive to acquire a new customer in sports than it is to retain an existing one. So if we can get this loop working, it makes everything not, much, not only much better in terms of growth, but in terms of efficiency as well. So what we wanted to do to help build this loop is give you three tools. Number one, understanding how habit formation works in women's sports. Number two, learning how to drive fans down an engagement funnel to make sure they're consuming more frequently, more in depth, more often. And number three, to get ideas for how you can actually implement some of this in your world, whatever this is. The way that we've gone about doing this, just to give you a bit of insight into the research we've done, as Tammy said, a load of different partners across sports in the UK came together over 2022 to track the actual behaviour of sports fans between June and November. And our research partner, Mesh Experience, tracked more than a thousand people across the UK in depth with every single experience they had with sports. Now, that experience could have been watching sports on TV. It could have been going to an event. But it could also be in those little moments that do matter throughout our lives. It might have been a conversation about women's football with a friend. It might have been reading something in the newspaper. It might have been seeing a post on social media. Any touch points we have logged and we've been able to go through and work back and see what are those moments that matter in driving consumption. And we've also overlaid that with contextual data from across all the partners that you can see here to get a really full picture of what the state of habit in women's sport looks like. So turning moments into habits really looks like this funnel that we've got on the screen here. Now, we'll keep coming back to this in the presentation, so worth, worth going through this now. What we're really talking about is moving people through from a position of not engaging particularly frequently to engaging much more. Stage one might be someone watches the Wimbledon Ladies Singles final every year or catches a bit of action on a major event like the Commonwealth Games ha that happened last year, but aren't consuming women's sport more frequently or more in depth than that. What we want to do is move people from stage one to stage two or stage two to three or three to four. And everything that we've been looking at is how to move people down this engagement funnel um, to give you the tools to do that even better than before. So how are we going to do that? We've got six things to take you through today in terms of turning moments into habits. We'll quickly run through these now, but they will structure our discussion today and I will bring in our partners to discuss some of these themes in more detail. Firstly, habits in women's sports are much less fixed than in men's sports, and that provides an opportunity as well as a challenge. Dominating the attention window is more important than ever that's true not just in women's sports, also in men's sports, but what can we do about that in women's sports to make sure that we grow? Excitement is queen. Coming back to those three words I told you to look out for earlier, this is going to be a really interesting one, I think, for us to go through. Major events broadcast on TV ignite fandom. Attendance is the bedrock of habits. Again, one of those words I told you to look out for. And domestic experiences cement habit. So let's get into it. Habits in women's sports are much less fixed in men's sports. So let's take a look at this. Across the research period, we looked at the number of experiences participants had with sports and we measured what they said about the impact of these. So on the x-axis at the bottom, you can see the number of experiences they had. And on the y-axis on the, on the kind of top to bottom, you can see how they felt, how they felt about those experiences in terms of likelihood to change their behaviour. And what we saw was that regardless of the number of experiences that people had with women's sports, they were more likely to lead to positive behaviour change versus the equivalent number of experiences in men's sports. And what that means is that our audience's behaviours and beliefs and habits 
are much looser and much more in flux in women's sports than they are in men's. And that's true when we look at the frequency of attendances and the variety of attendances too. So we're at a moment in time when audiences are increasingly interested and engaged and they feel positively about women's sports, but they're not yet set in their ways. So we need to be thinking about how might we move them forward towards different behaviours. The second insight that we wanted to share was that dominating the attention window is more important than ever. Now, I said earlier that we tracked people across June to November, and this shows you all the weeks from June to November. So 26th week of the year coming through there. And what we can see is that in yellow and in that light blue, we've got sports experiences featuring female athletes. So women's sport, what we would be counting that is women playing only against other women. So a good example of that might be women's football, for instance. In that mixed sport bar, we would have something like track and field, where it's really difficult to divide out men's athletes from female athletes when someone's watching that sport. So that blue and that yellow coming together to show broad consumption of women's sports. And what you're probably noticing here is that we see a peak coming in the summer, another kind of slight rise happening early autumn, and then really it's men's sport dominating later into the autumn. Now, part of this is due to the scheduling of major events, like the Women's Euros in England last year, like the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham during the summer months. And in fact, it was sports that were featuring in major events that were in the UK that were disproportionately coming through in the experiences that we tracked. But there's also something really interesting here going on about interest in particular sports. One in three of all experiences in women's sports last year was with women's football. One in three. And that's actually before we look at football overall. Almost one in two experiences that we captured across men's sports, women's sports, mixed sports throughout that period was a football based experience. This sport really dominates the national conversation in the UK. And if you're dialing in from another country, another territory, it might not be that it's football that dominates, but there might be a sport that tends to command a greater share of attention. And this speaks to a deeper point that women's sport, whichever sport it is, needs to find and own an attention window where it can win. So last year in the UK, it was the window that was free from men's football that was doing that job. Actually, if we look at the, the next slide here, we can see that major events like the Women's Rugby Union World Cup in New Zealand, and the men's, women's and wheelchair rugby league World Cup that happened in England really struggled to break through outside that football free window, particularly when going up against the men's football World Cup that happened last year. And it's actually not just other sports that present a challenge to women's sport in this battle for attention. However hard we try, however much time we might want to craft out for ourselves, there are only 24 hours in a day. And sometimes it's other activities that went out. We did a, a little exercise through the research where we surveyed people who hadn't logged an experience around the England Lionesses semi-final or final victories last year. And we asked them what they'd been doing at the same time. And what you can see here is that a really decent proportion of them were engaged in other leisure activities, whether that was watching something on TV or a film or meeting friends. And this is something that we need to put into context. How do we make women's sports a brilliant leisure activity that people want to prioritise and put above those other things. At this point, we're going to look at a more sporting example here. Whatever the battle for attention is, and I know that we talked about actually women's rugby struggling to break through in some of those football periods, we know that having any kind of attention window really does matter. That attention is very valuable. And I'm going to bring in Sally Shepherd here, who's head of customer engagement at the RFU to discuss some of this with us. Sally, we have a graph on the screen ahead of us. What is this telling us? Um, what have you at the RFU been doing to, to maximise attention for women's rugby? Uh, thank you, Claire. And yes, good morning, everyone. It's, it's great to be here. As um, Claire mentioned before around our, our broadcast numbers, 
we knew that it would be difficult to, to break through during the Rugby World Cup or with the Rugby World Cup last year, partly because of the competition we had up against the Premier League. But we also knew that, that our kickoff times being in the middle of the night would be really difficult to capture people's attention. However, we did know that the tournament would bring a large peak in interest around women's rugby and we needed to capitalise on this. So what you can see on your screen is, is our sales curve um, for the Red Roses fixture against France, which is being played at the end, end of April. What it shows is that we were able to use the attention from the Rugby World Cup to drive ticket sales for future fixtures, especially with new audiences that haven't previously bought with us. I thought I'd give you a couple of points on, on how we got there. So firstly, we foresaw this spike in interest and working with our partners at Six Nations, other home unions and the venues for our other Six Nations fixtures, we ensured that tickets went on sale to capitalise on this. It may sound simple, but it's not that long ago that we had a very short sales window to sell tickets for women's events. Secondly, we didn't purely rely on broadcast and media coverage to provide interest. We created a fully integrated campaign which positions women's rugby as being exciting and entertaining to watch and use this to drive interest. As part of this, we had a really targeted digital cam campaign to capture data and importantly drive those ticket sales. Both of these allowed us to see the peak in sales that you can see on this graph but it also brought people into our sales funnel that we've since been able to convert and has allowed a continuation of selling to new purchases. The match is a month away, we've sold more than 40,000 tickets and we can see from our data that we're bringing in a new audience, but really importantly, a more diverse audience to rugby. And we have that data to continue their journey with us after the fixture in a month's time. So although we didn't see a large number of pe people watching women's rugby in the middle of the night, the attention from a global event was key to capturing interest, driving ticket sales, um, but also data for, for future events. Back to you, Claire. Thank you, Sally. I love some of those points there, especially that long-term impact of attention. It is not just attention that matters in a particular window, it's how it can be used in the longer term to drive that habit. Now, we know that habits are up for grabs, capturing attention window really matters. The third insight we want to share is all about how to take advantage of that. And I think this is one of the most exciting things from today, which is that excitement is queen. Now, when we looked at all the factors that might influence someone's likelihood to consume women's sports, we asked people to say what they believed in and what they thought was important. And we looked at then their consumption of women's sport. And what we saw is that the key factor that had the most strong relationship with someone's likelihood to consume women's sport was believing that it is exciting. Believing it's exciting and that there is a good atmosphere around it. That matters much more than all those other factors. I'm conscious there's quite a lot of, of things going on on the slide that you've got in front of you now, but I really think it's worth dwelling on this. Again, what we can see on the y-axis going top to bottom is the percentage of people that we asked who agreed with a statement. So what you can see is that number seven, sport played by women is inspiring to others, was the one that had the highest number of people agreeing with it. But actually on the x-axis at the bottom, that shows the correlation between believing that statement to be true and consuming women's sport. And by far and away, the one that's coming out top there is number one, sport played by women is exciting to watch. So if excitement has the strongest relationship with consuming women's sports, but it's not quite up where it needs to be in terms of people believing it, we in women's sport have a job to do. Now, if we think back to that habit loop we talked about earlier, excitement really, really matters here. Think about that final stage, rewards, the adrenaline kick that you get when you feel excited about something, that emotion that keeps you coming back. Excitement's a thrill. Excitement could mean different things to different people. It could mean close competition, for example. It could mean a brilliant experience at a venue, at an event. It could mean high stakes for the winner or the loser. If you're anything like me, you probably found that the Women's Euros last year, particularly the final, was one of the most exciting moments of the year. So I thought it would be appropriate to bring in Kat Rowley here, who is brand lead for the FA, 
Kat, I know that you've been working in women's domestic football to build the excitement that's ultimately going to grow audiences' engagement. So it would be great if you could talk us through what you've been doing. Thank you, Claire. Yeah, so hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, my name is Kat Rowley. I'm the brand lead for the Barclays Women's Super League, Barclays Women's Championship and the Men's and Women's FA Cup. So I'm going to talk about two elements of excitement today. The first one being building a narrative of excitement. So back in 2021, off the back of insight from a previous Women's Sports Trust in Two Circles study, we made a conscious shift in our, um, in our narrative for the women's leagues. We recognised that historically, women's sport was dominated by narratives of inspiration and the pursuit of gender equality. So in other words, watching women's sport support it as a cause. Our strategic shift was moving away from good cause to great entertainment. So that means focusing more on what has always driven sporting fandom, which is the intense rivalries, the dramatic plot lines, the superstars who transcend the sport, the breathtaking skill and the competitiveness of our athletes. So this shift in approach has underpinned all of the campaigns we've done since 2021, not least the Women's Football Weekend campaign you may have seen playing out over the weekend. And these are huge fixtures, derby fixtures, we scheduled during an attention window created by the Men's Football International Break. The second point I'm going to talk about is building an atmosphere of excitement. So in the wake of the Euros, this season, entrenched footballing rivalries have really come alive this season on the biggest of stages. We've actually been playing games in clubs main stadia for a number of seasons now, but the big difference this season has been achieving a much higher percentage occupancy in these stadia for our headline fixtures. 13 club records have fallen this season so far across our top two leagues. Our Barclays Women's Super League attendance record fell early in the season with 47,000 watching the North London Derby at the Emirates. We've had 44,000 watching the Manchester Derby at the Etihad. And the Merseyside Derby has played out to record crowds at both Anfield and Goodison Park this season. Now, these record-breaking games are exhilarating to be part of, and not to mention that playing these games in iconic stadia unlocks better fan engagement opportunities, better hospitality options, all in all, an unforgettable match day experience. Of course, a lot of this is the Euros effect, but clubs are now really getting to grips with data capture and insight to better fill their stadium and engage their fans. And finally, let's also not forget the product itself. We've had unbelievably exciting battles on the pitch this season and our title race absolutely came alive at the weekend. Back to you, Claire. Thank you, Kat. As a fan of one of those teams towards the top of the table, I'm very excited about that in itself. Um, there are some knotty things to work through here. Now, this slide that you've got here might feel kind of obvious. We know that from a lot of different sports across all of sports, to be honest, but including women's sports, we know that tighter games tend to drive bigger audiences, particularly on broadcast. But actually, how is it that we in the women's sports world can create those tighter games? How is it that we create more competitive fixtures? What does that look like in terms of scheduling or formats or other things like that? And we also know there's a bit of a positioning job to do here too. We know that in play success is more significant than activity outside sports driving fandom. So what you can see here is surveys of basically asking people what goes into making them a fan of a particular athlete. And it's action on the field, their sporting talent or skill, or the fact that they are a winner that really matters. But when we look at the difference between male athletes and female athletes, we see that it's male athletes that are more strongly associated with these characteristics, with these aspects. So how is it that we can build those levels of excitement around female athletes? What does it mean to prioritise excitement? What does that mean in terms of content, creative, stories, language? How does that mean in terms, what does that mean in terms of narratives or rivalries or structural changes that we just talked about? I'm going to go on mute just to cough very quickly and I'll be back shortly. There we go, I'm back. So let's go on to our fourth insight that we've got here. So we know that commercial growth for women's sport relies on building engagement with women's sports at every stage of that funnel we showed you earlier. So that's what we're going to unpack further now. Here is our beautiful funnel again. And what you can see is that we defined different stages of the funnel using three key metrics. So their reported likelihood to attend women's sports, a level of preference for consuming women's sports and perception of women's sports as exciting. And when we looked at that first stage, going from stage one to stage two, we saw that it was those mixed sports broadcast on TV 
often as part of a major event that really matter in igniting habit forming journeys. Now, at this point, I'd love to bring in Marie Hepburn, who is senior major events consultant at UK Sports, to share some of her views on the role of major events in driving ongoing habits in women's sports. Marie, what have you been doing around women's sports and, and why have you been doing it? Thanks, Claire. Um, for us, it's been important to understand the role of major events um, and, and how we can support in turning moments into habits in women's sport. Um, through strategically prioritising flagship, flagship women's sports events in the UK, we've an important role to play in igniting and accelerating the consumption habits for women's sport. Creating in-person engagement opportunities at the highest level with exciting sport formats and competition plays a really important role in supporting the lasting engagement with domestic and national events programmes, both key in, driver, uh, in driving UK success in high performance sport. We know it's essential to have the right blend and right schedule of major events, ensuring there's a strong pipeline of both mixed and women's sports events coming to the UK in the future. With Women's Rugby World Cup, European Athletics Champs and the Women's T20 World Cup all secured in the pipeline for the UK, we have some great events to look forward to and then build on the resulting engagement that that will undoubtedly bring. Through our bidding process for major international sporting events and focusing on powering positive change through our major events programme in the UK, we can take the learning from this research and support the network to ensure the catalyst for engagement is maximised for lasting change. Back to you, Claire. Thank you, Marie. I'm enjoying people saying back to me, Claire, like I'm a newsreader. It's making me feel very special. Now, if we jump back into the slides, uh, let's build on some of these points a little bit further. Now, what we saw in the research that we did last summer was that when we were looking at moving people from stage one to stage two, so top of the funnel, down to being slightly more engaged, it was experiences in track and field as a sport specifically that were more likely to drive further consumption for people starting out. Now, obviously, there's some noise going on around there that it was largely major events like the Commonwealth Games that were doing that. But this is a really important point to notice. Actually, mixed sports in major events, they're a really good entry point to bring people in and then to build on further. And actually, if we go on to the next slide here, we know that major events featuring only women's sports and covered in breadth and in depth on TV also matter. So we've been talking about a lot about the Euros. Let's come back to it again. What we've done here is show you the average attendance growth, so the average attendances for the two teams in the final of the Women's Euros last year, so England versus Germany. And what you can see is a real jump up for the 2022-23 season in average attendances for both of those leagues. That is a noticeable improvement. Lots of the work that people like Kat have been doing to grow those attendances overall, but really turbocharged by a major event. And actually, in lots of anecdotal, but also data-driven evidence that we're seeing, we know that those major events have had an impact. Here are some quotes that come from surveys of people who've attended Arsenal women's football matches over the last season. We had a fantastic family day. Our daughters got really into following the WSL since the Euros. After the success of the Women's Euros, I was completely inspired by the Euros and particularly those players who play for the Lionesses, but also play for Arsenal coming through. Now, we know that sometimes legacy can be a bit of a charged word in sports, but this is the evidence of what can happen when a major event is followed up by ongoing action on the ground that's taking that initial interest and turning it into ongoing habits, whether that is through brilliant marketing, whether that is through using players, whether that's through making a conscious effort to put strategies in place, like Sally was talking about, going on sale when there is attention on it. This is all starting to come together. So we've thought about igniting interests and building habits, but what about that next stage, that middle stage? Well, it's here that sports focusing on women competing in female only competitions that have an impact. But actually there is another crucial point which is that beyond just seeing women's sports broadcast on TV, it is crucial to get people coming to events. You see on the left hand side there, conversations and live sporting events are key touch points for increasing engagement with women's sports at that stage. So if you remember nothing else from today, 
We talked about opportunity, excitement and attendances. This is the attendances point. Attendance is the bedrock of habit. Now, there is a reason why humans have been building Stadia for millennia, and that is that nothing beats a live event. What you can see on the side that we're about to show you, if it comes up on my screen, is that live events are consistently the best drivers of engagements with sports. What we've done here is map on all the different touch points across sports that we logged in the research last year. And what you can see on the x-axis at the bottom is how positive people felt about those experiences. And on the y-axis, you can see how persuaded they were, how likely they were to change their future behaviour in a positive way, so consuming more as a result. And you can see that live sporting events, even though there are fewer of them, it's a smaller circle than TV, for instance, comes up top for both. Live events are the best drivers of engagement. And women's sports properties can do more to create major domestic events. We've seen lots of big games in sports like football, where fixtures are held at main stadia, like Kat was talking about earlier, marketed on a bigger scale, and they're driving growth across European leagues. But while these are really important in pushing up overall attendance stats, I'm excited in a bit of a nerdy way uh, for another reason. And it's that these are all about getting people to return again later. If you've got a big game, how is it that you get those fans coming back, having attended once, rather than having to get them in in the first place? So driving attendances and then backing them up with excellent understanding of fans, excellent marketing becomes incredibly valuable. We've all seen headlines about record-breaking attendances over the last year or so. We even showed you some of them at the start of the presentation, but we are in interested in long-term attendance growth, not just vanity metrics. And that means brilliant, clear strategies executed week in, week out. I think another point that's important for us to recognise here is that attendances do not just breed further attendances. They actually generate interest beyond the stadium. Now, there's a lot of numbers going on in this table here, but it's actually that top row that's highlighted in purple that I want you to look at here. Women's cricket featured in the Commonwealth Games for the first time last year. The Commonwealth Games held in Birmingham in England, if you want to wear that. And we know that most attendees came from that region. What we've got here is broadcast data. And what we can see is that the region that showed most change in terms of the numbers of people watching only women's cricket, only the women's hundreds, between 2021 and 2022 was the West Midlands. So our correlation is that we've got more people watching women's cricket going to it and then more people watching women's cricket on TV out of the back of it. And that data is telling a story. So at this point, Beck from the ECB, who head of marketing, is going to join us. Beck, what does this table tell us? What's the story and what's the ECB doing to, to grow attendances across the women's game? Thanks, Claire, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I think this is a great example of how an international mega event can influence a seasonal domestic event. Um, I think, however, in cricket, similar to the prior example of football, um, we're now seeing a virtuous circle start to form where a really strong domestic event in the 100 is going on to influence our England women's bilateral events. Um, it's increasing the profile of players and it's giving us an engaged audience to tap into when it comes to attendance and following. Um, to set the scene a bit before where we're at with the England women, we've set an ambitious target of reaching 100,000 attendances at England women's events this year. Um, so the, to put that into context, that's double what we achieved last year. Um, and when I look at our recent success um, in England women's sales, I think the timing of all this is really important to note. Um, as Claire said, with 2022 being such a big year for women's sport and its growth, um, we saw that the combined momentum and the combined success of numerous major events really helped us um, to launch our England women's attendance strategy in September last year. Um, so we kind of looked at the women's Six Nations, the women's Euros, the Commonwealth Games, the 100, all coming before this moment to create a real groundswell for us to then launch our strategy. Um, and I think that really highlights the importance of us all continuing to work together as women's sport grows as a whole. 
Um, but in parallel to these major events rolling out and creating wonderful big headlines about attendances and broadcast numbers, um, we were all working feverishly to look at the England women's product, the marketing and the communications and our sales approach and try and get that right to drive exponential growth. Um, and in line with some of the other points that you've already outlined, Claire, um, the, there are a few key fundamentals there. And one of them was uh, fan first scheduling. So that wasn't all, only about looking at fan friendly days and times of the week, um, but the right combination of venues to increase reach and scale, bring more weight to the England women's product and create really exciting moments and momentum throughout a series. And then I think when it came to building excitement through a campaign, um, our joint ashes approach is a good example of this. So our scheduling strategy has been to link the men's and the women's ashes side by side. Um, they're running in parallel and that's enabled us to use the vast awareness and the passion for the men's ashes, which is so very well known, um, to position the women side by side. And we've created what hopefully many of you will have seen is the ashes to ashes campaign. Um, and similar to what Kat was saying before, that they're applying in football, we didn't want a campaign that talked about being on a journey or being inspired um, or kind of rising stars. Uh, we wanted a campaign to show that actually England women had already arrived. They were commanding big grounds. Uh, they were commanding big crowds and promising a really good show. Um, so, yeah, just a couple of examples there of how we're seeing some of this research come to light in cricket, which is hopefully helpful to others on the call. Thank you, Beck. If you've not checked it out already, would really recommend going and looking at some of that, that those campaigns that have been mentioned uh, throughout the session today. Really worth having a look at and taking for inspiration um, across wherever you might work. So finally, let's think about that final stage of building habit. Insight number six, domestic experiences cement habit. Now, again, we see some of the previous trends that we've talked about coming through strongly. We see that consumption on TV is a really in touch, important touch point that comes through at this stage alongside conversations and live sporting events. There's a mix to this. It's not just one being important at one stage and not others. And actually something we've not put on the side here, but is worth talking about is the role of social media. Social media was at its most powerful at this stage. It's not something that we were seeing driving consumption at the top of the funnel, so getting people interested from stage one to stage two. But when they're already showing quite a degree of interest, that's when it was kind of building them further and further through the funnel. So lots of things for, for us to think about. The further we go through the engagement funnel, the more significant the impact of women's only sports experiences on future likelihood to consume becomes. Now, again, if you remember early, we talked about sport played by women. So women only in a space featuring other women versus mixed sports like track and field, for instance. We talked earlier, those mixed sports quite important towards the top of the funnel. What you need to know here is that the further through the funnel we get, the more important the role of women's only sport becomes in driving that future engagement. So again, we've got a little bit of noise about what types of events those might have been seen in, but it's an interesting point to note. And we have spoken a lot about international sport during this session, with very good reason, dominated experiences in 2022. But when we drill down into the sports where we had a consistently high amount of domestic and international competitions last year, with lots of experiences around them, we noticed something interesting. And that was that it is domestic tournaments that are more likely to promote positive behaviour change in terms of consumption than those international tournaments. So if you look in the yellow there, we've got football. In the purple, we've got cricket. What you're looking at is the y-axis, that persuasiveness metric. And what you can see is in both cases, that is slightly higher for the domestic competitions than the international ones. So if we're wanting to build habit, it's not enough just to get people having that sugar rush, that high of the major events. We need to do what we've been talking about, take them on a journey, but get them through coming to the domestic where we can then start cementing that behavior change. But if we're thinking about the kind of moments that matter, there can be a bit of a tension. We know that across different women's sports, the best day of the week or time of the day for broadcast eyeballs isn't always the same as the best day for attendances, for instance. So a balance needs to be found rather than just prioritizing one over the other. 
So let's think back to our habit loop again, that cue, routine and reward that goes around in that virtuous circle. Let's think back to the cue. If you want to go down a, a hole on the internet learning more about habits, please do. Um, we know that scientific research shows that the importance of time, location, emotional states and other people all have a really important role to play in those cues that start off habitual behaviour. And what that means is that consistency is really valuable when building habits. We know that women's sport over the past 10 years or so has been on a journey and there have been quite a few changes. There's not always been that consistency that's there to enable habits to form. So we can do much more in building that consistency of things like scheduling, things like messaging around events, things like building the excitement, making sure there's a known experience that we talked about earlier. All those things that are recognisable. And it could also come around marketing. It could be in terms of what is the pattern that people expect in the build up to an event or when tickets are going to go on sale. All those things do matter. And what is it in all of these things that might provide a cue? That excitement coming into the emotional state, for instance, the location. How is it that uh, venues are chosen for women's sports that signal that it's an event that you should be coming to? All of these things play a role. So. That takes us through our six things that we wanted to leave you with today. Habits in women's sport being less fixed than in men's sport. Dominating the attention window, more important than ever. Excitement is queen. Major events on TV ignite fandom. Attendance is the bedrock of habit and domestic experiences cement habit. Those three words that I talked about, opportunity, excitement, attendances. But what does that actually mean in practice? What's the so what? We couldn't just leave it there with a lot of nice data. We need to think about what that might mean for you, for your organisations, and some of what our guests have shared too. How can we apply this learning? How might, might we create excitement or promote excitement? How can we get better with top to bottom scheduling and competitions and formats and structures? How can we connect international and domestic fandom brilliantly and also focus on domestic attendance growth? How can we leverage peak moments to drive those sales of events and products? All different questions that you might be having in your heads right now. And I know we've got the question bar where people have been popping in questions. Please keep doing that. What we have now is about 17 minutes left, I believe it is, um, to have a Q&A about how to turn those moments into habits. So I will pass back to Tammy and we'll be joined by our wonderful guests that we've welcomed through this um, to have a Q&A. Firstly, thank you very much, Claire. I can, I, from, from everybody, I'm talking for everybody now, it's absolutely fantastic presentation and so much insight in there. So team, if I can bring you all back, um, we have, um, we've got loads of questions through. You're a really engaged audience with the, you started off slow and then the, the questions that, uh, that have come have been fantastic. We had a little bit of problem with the sound. You heard a, a little bit of um, extra noise there at one point. So just a reminder to, to everybody to um, keep yourself on mute unless you're you're talking so we don't get that uh, happening again um first question was actually the first question um and i'm going to to ask us uh, sally to come in on this it was to do with ticket sales i found this one interesting um it, it was did the men's six nations also drive ticket sales for the women's six nations and, and we've seen through our own reporting into visibility that that one women's sport can be a gateway to other women's sports. So for me, I'd be, again, a fascinating question. Did the men's Six Nations also drive set ticket sales for the women's? Uh, it's a great question. And yes, the answer is yes, definitely. Um, we've found that all attention on rugby drives ticket sales for, for other events and, and women's events in particular. Um, and we look to maximise on this. The, the first time we actually saw it wasn't wasn't this year, wasn't this Six Nations. We actually spotted it back in 2019. So if, if people are rugby fans here, they might remember we did quite well in the Men's Rugby World Cups. We got to the final in Japan. Um, and at that time, we had women's autumn fixtures on sale. And we saw a leap in our ticket sales. And we quite quickly sort of pulled together a campaign to drive more ticket sales off the back of it. Um, and from that point, we've always looked to sell our women's events during those times um, when interest in rugby more, more broadly peaks. We've seen it this year during the Six Nations as, as well. 
Um, we have, however, seen a, a bigger lift since the TikTok Women's Six Nations kicked off on Saturday, um, which I think has, has been helped by the broadcast that we had on BBC. So we had about a, a million people watching the broadcast on Saturday and, and saw another big peak in sales. Um, but the answer is, is very much um, yes, it, it does support our women's sales when, when the men are playing. Super. Th thanks. Uh, thanks for that. I'm going to ask Kat to, if, uh, if I can um, uh, bring you in on something. It's, um, that, there's a lot of fear, I suppose, around kickoff times um, for the FIFA Women's World Cup. And, and there was a question around, will that have a detrimental impact on fans forming watching habits during the, the tournament? What's your takeaway on that? I would say... Yes, it will have an impact. However, I think overall there are far more positives and negatives for us, for us going into the Women's World Cup. So huge momentum for being crowned European champions in a home year as last summer. A 28-game unbeaten run under our amazing coach Serena. A record-breaking domestic season, which I talked about earlier. And I think all of this means that Habit is already in a far better place than it was prior to the Euros. This summer we expect the Women's World Cup to be the biggest ever. We absolutely expect to have a good share of the attention window and therefore... We on the domestic side, to be honest, we're planning for all eventualities, including for England to do extremely well, but other countries to do well too. So if Australia win, we've got Sam Kerr and others who will have a huge boost to their profile. So yes, we know last summer it was unique to have evening games um, perfectly scheduled at our home stadia, but the times aren't too antisocial for the group game so far. So 9.30, 10.30 in midday. Um yeah, so all in all, for us, we're seeing it absolutely is another opportunity to f to further build habit. Thanks, Kat. Going to keep keep you on for uh, just one other question here. And it's it's all about would would we have seen what, what was the is the teams in uh, where were where are we here we go would we see this uplift um, if England hadn't made the final in the Euros um, is 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 it the tournament or or the England team which delivered the boost. Um, I've got some opinions myself on that, but I'd love to know what you think. Um, you know, actually, myself and my colleague Marjana yesterday were talking about this because we were part of writing the original um, bid for the Euros a, a good few years ago now. Um, but for me, it, it, it's, it really is the tournament um, that, you know, generated the excitement. For me, it was it was having a tournament on that scale here in our home stadiums, which I think was the the major game changer. And, you know, of course it helped that we won. But I think, you know, even for the moment that England reached the sort of, they got out of the group stages and they started to progress. I think the, the effect was already there, the bulk of the impact that we've seen. So, you know, absolutely. I think for me, it's the tournament and the cherry, the, the icing on the cake was England doing so well. I'd say thank you, thank you very much for England doing so well as well. And I, I think there's something about... It, the increased visibility that you get from winning that actually, um, you know, our research that we did back in 2021, Claire, that, that all about some, um, you know, the visibility matters. Um, and, and these, and, and particularly of, of home nations, um, I think somebody needs to meet themselves. Oh, so I'll meet myself. Do you know what? I was just going to jump in again, Tammy, and, and yeah, say, go for it. I think just to build on what Kat was saying, I know the FA did a load of brilliant work on thinking about how to drive uh, attendances for the tournament, not just at England fixtures, but across the tournament overall for the women's Euros. And as Kat was saying, that really built all of that interest and engagement with women's football to then carry on into, into the further things. So lots of those points that we were talking about earlier um, of how is it that you can use major events, yet yeah, using interest in England, but also take that further to, to really build interest in the sport. It's worth, worth thinking about. And I'll go off mute for you again, Tammy. Thanks. Um, Marie, one for you. Can and will men's and women's sport work together to create the windows for major events that will help showcase female sport? Uh, thanks, Tammy. Yeah, I mean, that it, it's a tough one. And I, and I guess it depends whether we're looking at domestic, international um, sporting events for that. It, you know, it, I think what I would look at from a UK sport point of view is, 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 is what, what can we do? Um, and I think, you know, as, as in the UK, our, our focus on, on our age event strategy is to is, is the top-down approach. So as UK Sport, we we have hosting priorities and targets across 
um, our high performance sport network. So, so work closely with the partners um, to, to set those initial hosting targets for major events. And in doing that, can reflect on this research and, and look at that scheduling of events, what else is happening in that year, what else is happening at those times, and just make sure that flow and pipeline of events is reflective of a schedule that's going to maximise the benefits of those events in the UK. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, there's there's been a number of questions uh, got put, put in the, the question chatty thing um, about excitement and um, really sort of what makes excitement. For me, that's one of the most exciting things about this. Uh, what's come out of this is that um, we have data to show that um, it is excitement that drives. It's not just about being worthy. Um, that we need to move women's sport into, well, we, we said it way back when, moving women's sport from worthy to irresistible, so that excitement thing. I'm going to throw this out to all of you. What? How are you building excitement? What is making your sport exciting to the uh, to, 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 to people to attend, to, to watch? And Kat, you're moving around, so I'm going to come, I'm going to, come to you. I, I feel like you're itching to answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, obviously I, I talked about this earlier on. It's something that we, I guess it was our light bulb moment a couple of years ago because being in a particularly uh, male, dom historically male dominated sport, um, I think naturally we had found ourselves, you know, in the place of narratives around inspiration and, and worthiness. So for us, it was a it was a huge moment a couple of years ago to look at the insight that came out of the, the study, as I said, that Women's Sports Trust and Two Circles had done, and just to say, it's all about excitement. And for me, excitement means a lot of what I talked about earlier. It's, you know, making the most of these big rivalries. We, we are lucky within football. We know that we have these historic and very entrenched rivalries, but it's making the most of those derby, de uh, derby games, the top of the table clashes, um, obviously, if you can bottle what happened at the Women's Euros final last summer, for those of us who were there, that was just the most exciting game I've ever been part of. It's it's just, yeah, close, close games, top of the table clashes, derbies, and just dialing all of that up as much as possible. That's what excitement means, means to me. Fantastic. Um, I'm keen to sort of from people who are, are out there sort of doing it, all of you, you guys in, in, as, as rights holders, what you will take away from this research those sort of actionable insights that you can uh, take back to, to to sport and put in Beck, can i come to you with that question and maybe yes. go to the, your, the others of you afterwards as well yeah sure thanks tammy um i think for us it comes back to um two fundamentals here and one is about the scheduling and owning our place in the schedule and i think that um, certainly for England women this year, it's the first time that we can truly say that we've applied um, fan first scheduling principles. Um, but we did that at a time when this research hadn't actually come out. And so what's brilliant about this is that we have now got the science behind it to kind of warrant us to keep doing that. And when we're having those discussions internally to say, no, this is exactly what we should be doing now and what we should continue to do. Um, and so I think it will really help us as we um, try to look at England men and England women, for example, um, at the same time and make sure they're getting the same access to um, the best times in the calendar um, to help grow attendances and audiences. Um, and second for me, we've talked about it so much, it's, it's that excitement factor um, and whether we're talking about um, the opposition and rivalries or whether it's really exciting players who are coming up like when we have big moments to profile players um i'll use an example from the wpl with izzy wong getting her hat trick um and when we have big moments like that it's really profiling those players so that people can get really excited about coming and seeing them and and then it's kind of not so dependent on the performance of the day um and it's about coming and seeing your heroes there and, and um, I think what's really nice about a lot of women's sport is there's still a chance to kind of get up close and personal to those players and have your autograph signings and your selfies and that kind of thing. And that just all feeds into the excitement piece for us. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, that one that we're talking about, um, uh, scheduling and so forth, that one slide that Claire put up when you sort of overlay the sort of the men's Premier League, the men's football sort of on that and the impact it has. We know that it has an impact, but... To, to me, that really, really got the point across. And also this idea of um, attendance is the bedrock of, of habit. And we know that scheduling is so challenging when you're trying to 
um, do that things are, that are right for television, but also right for being in the stadium. It's such a, a challenging thing, but but obviously we need to work together to be able to build both audiences. Yeah, you know, really, really interesting stuff. Um, and the rest of you, any sort of other sort of actionable insights that you can take away from this? Though you just love those moments of, uh, of, uh, of tumbleweed. Um, lots to go away and think about. Oh, Sally, you're moving well, forward. I'm going to pounce on you. Thank you. On. I'll, ju I'll jump forward. in with something. I think Beck summarised my thoughts very well then. And I was sort of thinking very much along the same lines around scheduling and, and excitement. I think one thing that, that Kat actually mentioned, I think it's really important. I think, Kat, you said you use the phrase good causes to great excitement. And I think having a phrase that you can use internally with the people that you're working with on a day to day basis to remind them of your focus is really important. Um, and not just the people that you're working with, but people around you. So the stakeholders, the, the maybe the venues that you're talking to um, other other parties, commercial partners. I think having something like that really focuses um, people's at attention um, and kind of pulls everything together. Thank you. Um, we're 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 very, getting very close to the end. So Claire, I'm gonna I'm gonna just come to you, and and ask you what's what's next to learn. Oh, very good question, Sally. I mean, I think if we go back to what you were saying at the start, we've got kind of a change in women's sport that we've been seeing over the past few years. So going from that point of needing to be visible in the first place, we're now at a stage where women's sport is increasingly visible. We've come into how do we build habits? I think the next thing is really about once we've got that habit, what does commercial growth look like? Because that's what's going to keep women's sport growing. And I think that's where we're seeing good progress happening, but really needing to get the whole of the sports industry understanding what good looks like there. There's still more work to do. Um, so for me, that's what I'd be excited about of how is it that we create this habit and then do something with it, whether that is driving more participation for women and girls, whether that is making sure that we are headlining our female athletes so that they can be stars uh, on an equal platform as their, their male counterparts and that we've got the investment coming in. So that's the, the next bit for me, I think, is where I'd see it going. Yeah, absolutely. That's the next uh, fasc fascinating things to learn. And I, um, I there may be uh, bits and pieces that uh, both organisations, in fact, all our organisations are looking at to, to, to work on the, answering those questions. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for, for joining us today. Unfortunately, that's all we've got time for this morning. Please encourage your colleagues to head to the WST website to download a copy of the slides. Um, and thank you to all our partners for making this research possible. So Women's Sport Trust, Two Circles, UK Sport, the FA, the ECB and the RFU. And um, yes, have, have a wonderful day. <laughs> thank you.